In the dying days of the DC Cinematic Universe, we have the release of Shazam! Fury of the Gods. This is of course a direct sequel to Shazam! that takes place two years after the events of the first. Following the defeat of Dr. Sivana, played by Mark Strong, Shazam! Zachary Levi and the rest of his Shazam! family, or the Shazamly, as Wikipedia put it, continues their lives as a superhero group on the streets of Philadelphia. Billy Batson, also known as Shazam, is very concerned with keeping the six of them together and handling their superhero business as a family. Billy Batson, however, is going to turn 18. He has the fear of getting kicked out of his foster house. His foster sister, Mary, is getting ready to go to college. And his younger sibling, Freddy, has the desire to go out and do things on his own. So right away, it's made very apparent that Billy's communal world is sort of crumbling around him. That is, until a big threat comes into their lives. They are the daughters of Atlas, Hespera, Calypso, and Anthea. They steal the wizard staff in an attempt to then find the seed for the Tree of Life, to plant the Tree of Life in the God Realm, restore their world to perfection. Obviously, there wouldn't be a movie without a little bit of conflict. This wizard staff has the ability to steal the powers from the Shazam family, which happens multiple times in the movie, to everyone except Billy. And Calypso, played by Lucy Liu, gets the fantastic idea that they should plant the tree in the human realm. She's warned by her sisters that the tree will become twisted and corrupted and it won't flourish properly like it would in the God Realm. She clearly does not care as she sees this as a perfect opportunity to enslave and torture humanity for the rest of eternity. That's where I'm gonna leave it for the plot for now, but I think that's really all you need to know before I get into what I liked and disliked about the movie. First of all, I don't think it's as bad as everyone's been saying it is. I think one of the nails in its coffin was the fact that with the new leadership coming into the DC Cinematic Universe, post The Flash, a lot of these movies leading up to that feel like they won't matter in the long run, which then in turn gives the audience member a sense of nonchalantness in a way. Like, why am I going to see this movie if it's not gonna matter on the franchise going forward? And to be totally honest with you, I still feel that way about some of the future DC projects coming out before The Flash. For example, Blue Beetle and Aquaman 2. Before we go making wild accusations about the future of the DC Cinematic Universe, let's look at the present and what took place in Shazam! Fury of the Gods. First off, I want to make it very clear that if you know me at all, you know that I am the biggest advocate for superheroes as cinema. That is the age-old debate, well, really only a few years old debate, that comic book movies can be film. Of course, in this day and age, we've been spoiled by the Marvel Universe, the Marvel films, just getting churned out over and over and over again, each one feeling like it has less and less heart and soul in it than the previous one. And of course, my favorite movie of all time, Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice. I know that's a hot take, but listen, that movie is a stroke of genius. It is everything that a movie should be. It has every single cinematic quality contained within those two and a half, three hours that I think every superhero movie should do. And if you watch that movie with a certain viewpoint that I see it with, you understand that even comic book movies have the potential to be known as great films. With that said, something needs to be said for the fun superhero movies. Not exactly the franchise movies that Marvel pushes out, but a movie like Shazam! Fury of the Gods that at every turn is wholly entertaining. Shazam! 2 is pure Silver Age comic book fun, not overly concerned with pretentious cinema. When you look at the character of Shazam! and Billy Batson, it really feels like Zachary Levi, who plays Shazam!, has really figured out how to capture that 17-year-old spirit, even when he's in his adult Shazam form. It 100% feels like a 17-year-old kid who got superpowers and exactly what he would do in the real world. The best example I can think of is in the first movie when he's trying out his powers with Freddy, shooting lightning bolts, flying. It's that exact sense of wonder that Zachary Levi never loses at any point in these films. And for that matter, it spreads throughout the family. Maybe with the exception of Mary a little bit because she's overly responsible, but everybody in that film seems like they're having a great time, whether narratively or on set. Now, speaking of the Shazam family, it feels like having six of them, some of them were obviously more important than others, and the rest felt like they kind of got pushed to the side a little bit. Of course, Freddy and Billy are the main characters. 
Darla and Mary had their chances to shine, as we'll talk about in a minute, but Pedro and Eugene kind of just felt there, you know? They didn't really have too much of a purpose besides one or two key moments here and there. To the script's credit, this is a really difficult thing to do correctly, to handle this many characters. First of all, you have six main characters as superheroes. Then you have three villains. You have the Shazam family's parents and the wizard. That is a whole slew of characters, whether they were in the first movie or not, to keep track of in the second movie and make sure that everyone has proper screen time and proper development. Obviously, I would have liked to see this be done a bit differently in this film, but I understand how that could have been a difficult thing to do in certain time crunches or monetary values. A lot of the dialogue was super, super cringy, but then you also have to understand that it's teenagers with superpowers talking to each other in a modern day setting. So I guess cringe is the main factor in it, the main element that builds it up from the foundation when it comes to their dialogue. Although some of it did really work. For example, when the Shazam family is writing the letter to the Daughters of Atlas with the sentient pen Steve, Steve puts down every word that is dictated to him, including the, yeah, that sounds good, leave that in, Steve. It's very funny and works very well within the script. Secondly, Things like the Hey Khaleesi chant when Shazam punches Lucy Liu and the dragon. If you notice, Billy Batson has a House of the Dragon poster in his room, so it makes sense that he would make these sort of pop culture references as he is still a kid and probably thinks it's wildly funny. But also, and major spoiler here that they spoiled in the trailer for one of the movies, I cannot believe they did that. When the Shazam family and Billy Batson meet Wonder Woman at the end of the film, Billy's tone an attitude turns to 100% sheepishness when talking to Wonder Woman. And let's be honest, that's what all of us would sound like. So props to the script for keeping that in. However, my favorite part of the movie, when Billy is off fighting Calypso and the dragon, the rest of the depowered Shazam family have to go figure out a way to fight off the monsters in Philadelphia. The monsters that were released from the tree, being things like cyclopses, harpies, chimeras, anything you can think of really from mythical pages. The wizard tells them that the one thing that scares these monsters is the king of the monsters. And what is that you might ask? The all-powerful unicorn. So they find a unicorn in a dark parking garage and to tame it, Darla reaches down into her pockets and tosses a handful of skittles while whispering, taste the rainbow. Shortly after that, they're all riding on their own unicorn into battle with these monsters, where a close up on Darla shows her say, taste the rainbow motherfucker!" But the camera cuts off the magic of editing and she doesn't finish the word, just like I did there. It was the laugh out loud moment of the film for me. The villains were fine. Helen Mirren, Lucy Liu, Rachel Zegler. Rachel Zegler fitting more into the hero category, kind of. She was good in the movie, but I, I don't feel like I need to talk about that very much more than she did a good job. Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu kind of felt out of place at times, as much as I love and respect them both as actresses, it just kind of felt like maybe they were overacting a little bit. And keep in mind, I know nothing about acting, so I'm just spitballing here. But at certain times, it felt like they wanted to match the level of action with the movie by increasing their level of acting. And in certain points, a subtlety to the role does still fit in an action movie. Just for example, look at Zachary Levi at the end of this film, when he's sacrificing his life to defeat Calypso. Everything in that performance in that last maybe 20 minutes or so is very subtle and nuanced, and it still gets the point across just fine. The suits and the costume designs for the DC Cinematic Universe do not miss in the slightest. The Shazam family suits and the Daughters of Atlas suits were absolutely stunning. None of this MCU nanotech that, and then the suit comes on, that's just kind of lazy. That's sort of just like shoving it off to CGI and giving the visual effects guys more work to do as if they're already not overworked. DC Cinematic Universe suits, however, most of them are practical. Most of what you see is actually on the character. Now that might change coming towards the Flash, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. The Shazam suits though, they are gorgeous. And there's not much more I need to say than that. Just take my word for it, they are gorgeous. And now, the thing that tied this entire movie together for me was the Gal Gadot Wonder Woman cameo at the end. Seeing how this is probably going to be her last time donning the suit, it was very, very cool to see that they gave her a highly respected position 
within this film. I mean that sort of narratively because the Shazam family and the wizard all knew who she was. She was responsible for bringing Billy back to life and flourishing the tree of life in the God Realm. This is one last swing at it to show that Wonder Woman is an all powerful being that should not be trifled with. But the single thing that made this Wonder Woman cameo better than any cameo they could have planned at all was the second that you see her boots stomp on the ground, you hear the Hans Zimmer Wonder Woman theme from Batman vs Superman. That alone was almost enough to get me to jump out of my seat. If this is the last time we see Gal in the suit, I love the fact that she was sent off in such an endearing way. Now, lastly, I know everybody is thinking about the end credits scene with Amelia Harcourt and John Economos. With James Gunn and Peter Safran heading the future of the DC Universe, we don't really know what that entails for our favorite characters, specifically Shazam, who is being recruited for the Justice Society. Your guess is as good as mine when it comes to what characters James Gunn may be keeping and which ones he may be axing. Overall, I think that the mere inclusion of this end credit scene is more confusing to anybody and left a really weird taste in the audience's mouth after they left the theater. I know it did for me. In an otherwise super entertaining flick, it was just odd to have that kind of confusion and uncertainty fill your mind and that's what overtakes your memory as you leave the theater and drive home. At the end of the day, I don't think that Shazam Fury of the Gods is going to be heralded as a juggernaut of superhero cinema. However, I do think it is a super, super fun movie with very notable cinematic elements. Of course, there are a few things they could have done better as I mentioned, but when you just take the film at face value, a fun movie about a 17 year old superhero, you should not be disappointed. 2023 is a stacked year for film, so keep an eye out on this channel for more projects. And with that, thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next Cellar Dwellers film review.